Hi, I'm Patrick Shields, and I'm the Executive Director at the Learning Policy Institute. I'm here today to welcome you to this convening on the Local Control Funding Formula at 10. The event is designed for us to, to give us an opportunity to reflect back on um, all of the, that, the accomplishments of the Local Control Funding Formula, to take a, a look at the degree to which it has strengthened and supported greater educational equity and quality in the state to examine its impact on student learning, and to think a bit in our last panel about how the policy might be strengthened as we move forward. But before we get into the specifics of the agenda, I just want to take a step back and think a little bit about um, how not only deep LCFF was, but how broad it was in its policy shifts that we experienced a decade ago in California. So first and foremost, of course, the local control funding formula was an historic revamping of how state dollars find their ways to local school districts based now on student need. In addition to the base funding formula, there's a 20% supplement for each um, student who is a foster youth, English learner, or um, comes from a low-income family, and an additional 65% concentration grants for each of these student groups when in, in their enrollment exceeds 55% of the district enrollment. That's a really big thing and made California <clears throat> one of the most progressive funding states in the nation. But there was much more to LCFF. And I didn't know how this happened, but Mike Kirsch explained to me this morning it was the magic of the trailer bill, where there was a lot of things that were put in at the last moment. First, an unbelievably a radical shift occurred when 41 different categorical programs, which were part of the state's funding formula, that is dollars that went to the district that said they can only be spent for this purpose at this level um, for these kinds of kids, were eliminated and all block granted and those dollars given to the states, to, excuse me, to the districts to use as flexibly as they wanted. That was a major change. So we not only had a different kind of funding formula, but also a much greater autonomy at the local um, district level. And with that autonomy did come the requirement that not only district administrators and school personnel, but parents, students, and other interest holders be able to participate in the decision making around how those flexible dollars were used. At the same time, in this trailer bill, the old test-based accountability system, which was uh, part of you know, the NCLB era that we all know well, was <clears throat> thrown out and replaced with a much thor more thorough and broader accountability system, which included eight state priorities, including opportunities to learn indicators like school climate and access to courses. So not only were um, students and their families being held accountable, but adults and schools were being held accountable as well. To support all of that, the state built a statewide system of support, which included the creation of the um, collaborative for, uh, California Collaborative for Educational Excellence and a renewed role for county offices of education. And then concurrent, separate, it wasn't literally part of LCFF, but the state jettisoned the, its um, California standards and adopted the Common Core State Standards, which focus much greater on meaningful understanding and conceptual understanding of content and threw out the California standards test and replaced it with Smarter Balance. So all of these things happened concurrently all at one time, 2012, 2013, this all occurred. And it has had major impact on the ch radically changing the educational landscape in California over the last decade, which is what we're going to hear about from our um, panelists today and our speakers. So let's turn to the um, agenda. Okay, so we're going to start the day with a retrospective panel that examines the origin of LCFF, how we got to where we were. Um, and we're grateful to have an amazing cast of characters who were there at the beginning and helped with the origin and the implementation of it. Governor Jerry Brown, his um, then state board uh, president, uh, Mike Kirst, our friend, uh, then finance director, um, uh, uh, Anna Mata Santos, and public advocate's attorney, um, John Alfeld. So that'll be the first thing. Then Rucker Johnson, our colleague from the University of uh, California, Berkeley, uh, will uh, report on a recent study that he's done on the impact of um, LCFF on student learning and other outcomes. 
And following that, Governor Newsom, who wasn't able to be here today and sends his regrets, um, did participate in a video interview, um, and we're gonna show that video um, after, the, after the panel. And then we'll close out uh, with a prospective look at how we might be able to strengthen LCFF going forward. And that'll include the perspectives from an educator, an advocate, um, a policymaker, um, and a practitioner. And then the program will um, wrap up at 4.30, at which point we'll be having a reception outside that we'd be happy for you to join us. Okay. But before we get started, I wanted uh, to thank a couple of people. First, to the California Department of Education, Jonathan I, is here somewhere, um, for all of your assistance in getting us the data that we needed to do this work, and in particular, the study that you're going to hear from Rucker today. We'd also like to thank our funders from the Hewlett Foundation, the Rakes Foundation, the Stewart Foundation, the Skyline Foundation, <coughs> and the Kellogg Foundation. And then just a note, we'd also like to thank our audience who's joining us virtually. We've got a few hundred people online virtually. This is the first time that uh, we've put on such a hybrid event and we're hoping that it goes well. Okay, a few housebreaking, uh, housebreaking, housekeeping rules. <laughs> We're, encour we're encouraging people to uh, wear masks if you can. They're available outside. It's right after Thanksgiving. As you know, there's often upticks in COVID right after that. There is Wi-Fi available. It says up here, Kimpton Guest, the password is fast. Uh, the briefing is going to, we're going to keep going. We're not going to have any break. So if you need coffee, drinks, or anything, feel free to get up and uh, go out and get that yourself. And then we're going to have a, a question and answer period after each of the uh, panels or speeches today. Um, and there uh, is in your program a QR code that you can use. Uh, there's a link uh, up there for questions. You can see where it is. Um, or for those people here in the um, audience physically, um, there are note cards in your folders that you can just uh, write on and hold up, and one of us uh, will come and, and get you. Okay. So then this, this brings us to our first panel, which is going to be led by Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, who, as you know, is the president of the Learning Policy Institute and also a professor emeritus at, the, um, at Stanford University and president of State, School, uh, State, Bo State Board of Education, and uh, someone who's well known here and has done so much um, for education in the state over the years that we thank her very much. So Linda, can you want to come up? to um, call, ask uh, our panel to come up uh, and join me on the stage. I'm going to say a few things to set the stage, but we will then jump right into our conversation. So Governor Jerry Brown, uh, who needs no introduction, uh, and we'll look for you at that far end of the, uh, served as a state of California uh, four terms as governor. I think that's a record. With his leadership and support, the LCFF was enacted early in his most recent tenure. Uh, we are so grateful to you, Governor Brown, for that work and for joining us today. Uh, Mike Kirst, who's been uh, mentioned already, is Professor Emeritus of Education and Business Administration at Stanford and my longtime colleague and friend. And he served as president of the California State Board of Education for all of those four terms uh, with uh, Governor Brown. Uh, and um, he was instrumental in shaping the LCFF and the reforms that accompanied it. Ana Montesantos uh, served as director of the Department of Finance during the Brown administration and then uh, continued to shepherd the policies implementation and evolution in her role as cabinet secretary uh, in Governor Newsom's administration. And John Affelt is managing uh, attorney at Public Advocates where he served as a lead counsel on major school funding uh, litigation and resource equity lawsuits. We met when we were working on one of those together. Uh, and in his work with coalitions like the LCFF Equity Coalition, the California Partnership for the Future of Learning, he's played an important role in forming the design and implementation of LCFF. And I'm gonna start us off with just a couple of minutes of a historical uh, walk down memory lane. Uh, where we've been and where we're going. In 2004, John Marrow did uh, a documentary film called From First to Worst. Uh, that was about 20 years ago. Directing air traffic in our nation's skies. Building the cars we drive. 
processing our tax returns, and handling tasks vital to our health. These and other critical jobs will likely be performed by the students now attending public schools in California, where one of every eight American children is educated. And that ought to scare every one of us. We've basically turned our back on schools. Once a leader in public education, California is now near the bottom. There's something, something missing in the system. Those schools are slums. There's no better word for it. We're always on a survival level. Coming up, journalist John Merrow examines how the nation's largest school system fell from first to worst and why that matters to the entire country. And here we are uh, a few uh, <laughs> years later, uh, well, actually earlier, <laughs> when Governor Brown was governor for the first time. This executive order will freeze all job hirings and job replacements in the state of California. California felt the effects of Proposition 13 immediately. The first firings were announced in San Diego, an across-the-board reduction in all county departments. And what will happen in the schools? Summer school went away for my second child, because that was one of the first things to be cut. Uh, and the textbooks became older, and the special services for uh, health became less. It affected a whole lot of other things, arts programs, music programs, phys ed, um, uh, language programs, counselors, nurses, librarians, libraries. They cut the classroom periods from seven periods to six periods, and then some school districts cut to five periods. So we actually cut the school day in high school dramatically. People who came here all through the period of the 80s and into the 90s were shocked at how bad things were in a lot of the schools. I was one of the people who came here in the late 1990s and was shocked <laughs> by the condition in California schools. So by 2010, uh, right before Governor Brown started his second um, set of terms, uh, California was one of the lowest spending states overall, uh, one of the most uh, unequally resourced and segregated states for students, 50th in ratios of pupils to teachers, administrators, counselors, in the bottom five states on every achievement measure um, uh, in uh, math, reading, et cetera. Uh, during that time, it was not only that money was being cut uh, because of Proposition 13, but also how it was being spent uh, before 2010. We had uh, more of the money going to corrections, which increased by about 900%, uh, which finally outstripped the public dollars for public higher, higher education during that period of time. So it was a, a challenging uh, moment for not only schools, but for the state as a whole. Uh, we had a test-based accountability system, as Patrick mentioned, uh, that did not improve the outcomes. Uh, the tests were focused on low-level skills. There was not really an incentive to enrich the curriculum. People doubled down on the math and reading tests. It was hard to know what caused uh, ups or downs in test scores because the drivers of achievement were not visible in the accountability system. Uh, the mandated solutions were uh, viewed by districts often as unhelpful. Some of you remember date and sate and things like that that were the mandates that came down. And then the focus on rating schools and teachers during that era, which was you know, the No Child Left Behind era as well, uh, really ignored uh, many things that are important, poverty, homelessness, the inadequacy of school resources, the role of district and state policies. So then it all changed. Um, Governor Brown was elected, thankfully. Uh, Mike Chris became uh, chair of the state board. Tom Trollickson became state superintendent. Uh, Bill Honig ran the Instructional Quality Commission. Uh, Mike at one point called this the rise of the septuagenarians, and we were grateful uh, for the experience and expertise that came to Sacramento. Um, California then, of course, uh, launched this entirely different path uh, with the new funding plan, the new accountability strategy, um, the LCAP uh, uh, process to guide investments where communities have to think about uh, these priorities in relation to their achievement and their budget, uh, and then a much more supportive approach to schools. <clears throat> I saw Sue Burr somewhere earlier. There she is. <clears throat> she had a lot to do with this as well, both in the governor's office and then later on the state board, uh, the new standards, curriculum frameworks, and assessments also. <clears throat> and why is this not moving forward? I'm going to need help from the back to get, oh, there we go. 
And this just gives you a quick look at the kinds of opportunity to learn indicators that were developed in the eight state priorities and then later in the uh, school dashboard that really focused on whether kids were getting the opportunity to learn, the curriculum, the school climate, uh, the support systems, uh, not just uh, the measuring the test scores. Um, since 2010, we have had st uh, very strong increases in the graduation rate, as you can see. Uh, and those increases have been for every student group, and uh, especially for black students, Latinx students, Pacific Islander students, which have uh, improved at a much higher rate. We had among the largest gains in fourth grade reading from 2011 to 2019 in the nation. Um, on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Uh, we had the largest gains of any state in eighth grade reading uh, between 2011 uh, and 2022, despite the fact that during that time, our school population became uh, increasingly low income and linguistically diverse. Um, we uh, also climbed in math uh, for a period of time, as you can see, but then fell back like other states during the pandemic, although not quite as much as the national average. Uh, but we, you know, certainly got hit by the pandemic like other states did. Our progress on state tests is just beginning to rebound, and we still have large achievement gaps uh, even as that process is uh, undertaken. So we have challenges yet to um, confront, and we're going to start talking about those now. Uh, among those challenges is that we do have deepening poverty for California school children. Just last year, the percentage of low-income students in California increased from 60% to 63%. Uh, more students experiencing homelessness and in foster care. Uh, we have learning recovery needs. We have educator shortages uh, that uh, increasingly seem to call for system redesign. We have a rapidly changing knowledge economy that's calling for deeper learning and um, implications for changes in curriculum and assessment. And we have state revenue challenges that were, if you're paying attention, and most of you are, announced um, more just this last week. So uh, it's not that there's nothing to do. Uh, that We've had uh, quite an important turnaround in the state's um, capacity for education, and we also have a set of challenges for the next 10 years. So we are going to, with this amazing panel, uh, talk about both how LCFF got started, what it looks like today, and where we ought to go in the future. And I want to start with Governor Brown, uh, who got this whole ball rolling. Uh, when you came into office in 2011, uh, we had a broken education system, uh, clearly. And uh, you really tackled that task with Proposition 30 and LCFF immediately. I remember uh, you telling the legislature at one point that they were going to have the fight of their lives if they didn't uh, enact this legislation. Uh, can you talk about why you were so insistent on this reform and how you accomplished raising taxes, which was unheard of at that time, and okay. distributing funds uh, more equitably? Uh, assuming my memory is reasonably accurate, this is the way it appears to me. Uh, first, uh, I started running for governor. And when you run for governor, uh, the press likes you to have a plan on all these different <laughs> topics, crime, uh, crime, environment, taxes, education, whatever. So I had to have an ed education plan. So knowing Mike Kirst, since I appointed him way back in 1975 as uh, uh, president of the state board, I call him and say, OK, what, what's a good plan for education? <laughs> Give me a plan. I need a plan. OK. So uh, he. Uh, I don't know, he, he told me, or I'd heard it before, something about a weighted student formula. Mm. I didn't know what the hell that was. Mm. I said, okay, it, <laughs> it certainly did not sound exciting to me. Uh, but anyway, uh, I got my plan together, it, it, somewhere probably online, had more, a few points to it. And I remember being on the phone, talking to Mike, and actually typing at the computer as he uh, talked to me, and we got this plan going. I mean, that, so that, that's how it happened. It's pretty simple. Uh, you talk to the expert, uh, and you write down what he says, and then, <laughs> and then you start talking about it. So that's, that's how um, local control formula. It's Mike Kirst, I think he read a few other scholars, and he'll tell you about that. Uh, but I was just the implementer um, now. So that was that. I also, um, I like the idea of reducing complexity. 
Uh, I, I am troubled by, by jargon, by obscurity, by obfuscation, uh, by, the, uh, by the miasma of, of chaos and confusion. I like clarity. Let's get to the point. And so the idea of, that we're going to simplify, uh, not all these different categorical programs, struck me as a good idea. Uh, I, I remembered the first time when I became governor in 1975, I kept getting all these education bills. And I couldn't tell. I said, well, what, how did this go? I try to think back when I was in school. Uh, all this money and all this, I didn't quite know what it all meant. And uh, so uh, I had a certain skepticism since I had a hard time evaluating these bills. There were so, so darn many of them. And uh, so I like the idea that we're going to give money to where it is most needed and where the educational deficiencies uh, show up the most because of inadequate income, because of uh, language, lack of uh, English language skills, or because of the experience of being in foster care. That sounds so clear, so simple. Uh, great, why don't we do that? And so that became our program. Now, as soon as you do it in government, everybody wants an equal chair, uh, the, the legislators. Now, this program was not about an equal share. Well, it was about an equal share because it was about moving from an unequal situation to recognizing uh, that we needed to uh, put more funds where the challenges were greater. But that meant taking some money from the suburbs, or so they thought. Uh, so that was a big problem. And uh, we have an assemblyman here who can explain it because he was kind of part of the, part of the challenge. <laughs> he, he represents it. <coughs> He's right down there by Palos Verdes, and then that's not Watts, and that's not East LA. So but he's doing his good job, and, and he's going to tell you from his point of view, which I don't know what it is now because that was so many years ago. But anyway, <laughs> we had to maneuver around the, the, the people who wouldn't benefit the most. And luckily, and actually, because uh, I checked, by the way, because my memory's not perfect, but I called my two legislative advocates, Gareth Elliott, and Camille Wagner and just got tuned in. And they told me, uh, I, I, I don't know why they could be so candid, but that uh, one of the Senate leaders or one of the legislative leaders didn't really understand the program and was not getting with it. But after a while, this person really got the program and became a big pusher and that helped. And then the uh, Black Caucus and the Latino Caucus also got behind it. So. Uh, that allows us to overpower some of the resistance. I do remember a meeting uh, with, uh, it was in the small office room, we had the uh, school boards, uh, school boards association, I can't remember if it was all of them, or, but it was basically the people who didn't like it. And they all complained, <laughs> and we had a meeting, I don't think I convinced anybody. And I said, boy, we're gonna have to work with them. And then, I, I, Gareth didn't think, the, the CTA played a part, but I think they, they did. I think we had to get some real muscle from CTA to get this thing done, and that happened. So, uh, so that's all part of it. Then, of course, Prop 30 with the new money, that made everybody feel good, um, and we had to get that money. People said, boy, you had to be bold to go after a tax increase. I said, well, not, not really. Because number one, the place was falling apart. Oh, I didn't get a tax increase. I might have not gotten reelected. So remember, <laughs> politicians think about elections. And when you don't have any money, people get angry. So we had to get more money. And the schools were having layoffs. It wasn't a good thing at all. You saw that in the movie. So, um, but when we pro designed Prop 30, the idea was let's tax the fewest people that we possibly can. And the way you do that is you go to the top 1% which is not the other 99%. So that's what we did. Now, that's equity, because these people have more damn money than everybody else. And two, there's only a relatively few of them, so they can't really stop it. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. This is not a vote of all the people saying taxes. This is a vote of saying, tax them and help save our schools. That was the idea, and it passed. So the politics were, were good. And, uh, but the substance was good too. And as far as the, the uh, local control uh, funding form, the idea of local control, uh, it, uh, I was this idea of uh, subsidiarity, 
localism. That was a notion I got in Catholic school, and it's an old Catholic doctrine from one of the popes from 100 years ago, the idea that the family is the principal institution, and then other institutions, whether it's the parish or the city government, uh, the state, and then the national government. But there's a hierarchy here, and you want to uh, ha entrust the responsibility where something can be best exercised. And uh, in this case, uh, the family or the local school. And so uh, I was impressed by that. Um, and it's still a big issue between the parents and the teachers. Uh, but I also think um, knowing how government works, uh, if you're going to run everything out of Sacramento, which is what they try to do, uh, it doesn't quite work. Because when you're in the classroom, it's the teacher and the students. You shut the door, that, that, that's what's there. Now, you got to have curriculum. You have to have a good uh, environment. You have to know what you're doing. The teacher has to be skilled. But at the end of the day, all these thousands of laws, and I've signed thousands of them myself. I signed 16,000 laws as in my 16 years. And we have, uh, I don't know, a million words in the education code, all trying to tell that teacher in that classroom and those students how to perform. But at the end of the day, it's all about a skilled teacher. You get a skilled teacher by having good preparation, by having good on-the-job training, uh, by having good coaching, good monitoring, and good support, and good salaries to attract people, which are still not anywhere near good enough. So all this complexity and all this accountability, uh, it's very limited uh, in terms of its impact uh, unless you're building on a very skilled teacher uh, supported in the classroom. And uh, that's, that's why I was very uh, attracted to the idea of cutting the categorical programs, giving authority at the local level, and even the accountability measures through the local control uh, accountability plan is written at the local level. So that, those are the ideas. It made a lot of sense to me, and um, so that's why I was glad to do it. But again, it, it came from Kirst and these other unknown scholars that he'll tell you about. And, uh, and we were, all, we're, we're ready for it. And I must say, <laughs> the legislature will always want to add more restrictions, more mandates, more orders. But think of the idea of that classroom with people in Sacramento issuing commands. Think of the legislature as in a big bunker. And they're sending <laughs> out the commands to 6 million kids and 330,000 teachers. Do this, but don't do that. And in minute detail, getting ever more minute as the years go on. And this will happen more and more. Then you have our friends, our good friends in the equity community who want to bring lawsuits. And every time you have a lawsuit, you have to have a settlement. And the way you settle is you create a program. And once you create a program, <laughs> it's some standardized program. Sounds like another categorical. People talk diversity, but they really like standardization. And uh, as being mildly uh, anarchic to fit with my authoritarian aspect, uh, <laughs> I do like diversity of thinking, of planning, of idea, and practices. Yes, and that's the tension, because yeah. you need some goals, you need some standards, but you have to let local people do their thing. Yeah. So that was the idea, and from a philosophical point of view, from a practical point of view, because all the state can do is issue a law, sign a law, issue a regulation, send out an email. They can't <laughs> go to the school, and they can't get in the classroom. And they, if they do, it's for one day a year. And the teacher's got to be there 185 days. Yeah. So uh, at the end of the day, we are completely uh, dependent on what is occurring in a classroom or in a local school. And that's where our focus should be. What boosts that up? And I think we could get rid of a lot of regulations if we had better training, better coaching, better monitoring, and more money for teachers. If we had that, I think we could cut a lot of the other stuff. <laughs> it's a very um, well-formed philosophy. What? And I was uh, honored to serve as the chair of the Teacher Credentialing Commission in your administration and uh, to begin some work on that point, which I think is uh, 
Very well stated, thank you. And Mike, you know, uh, you used to talk about the hardening of the categoricals, uh, which, you know, was part of this uh, major reform that Governor Brown has been describing here. Uh, you had a different philosophy uh, about how to get budgets to drive better decisions, which showed up in the notion of the LCAP. Uh, can you talk about how you tried to get districts to connect budgets to educational ideas and actions um, through the design of the reform? Yeah, well, the original ideas go back to a paper written in 2008 for Governor Schwarzenegger. Uh, he declared uh, 2008 to be the year of the education reform. And so Goodwin Liu, who J Jerry Brown appointed to the California Supreme Court and I uh, began to put together a bunch of ideas and we brought Alan Burson in who was the Secretary of Education under Schwarzenegger thinking that might influence the governor. Uh, but the recession hit and there was no year of education and that got shelved. So later on I'll throw out my new ideas for where we ought to go here and even though we're under physical challenges if you look at something that was really designed in 2008 and it happened in 2013, you know, we can't, we, we got to look at the longer run here. So the basic ideas, uh, I, I think, were uh, expressed well by the, by the governor. The, the old plan uh, wasn't a plan. It was an historical accretion uh, with no underlying rationale. It had no sense of equity. Uh, in fact, there was categorical programs, and when they used to get too much to the low-income districts, they passed a categorical called Program Improvement Grants. And it was just for uh, up, uh, wealthy districts so that they could get to be the same. And they called it PIG, uh, Program <laughs> Improvement Grants. And so that was a, uh, I mean, it was just nuts. And so uh, uh, it, it was very hard to defend the existing system. Uh, and, and I think that was important as well. So as the governor said, we tried to simplify it down to some basic ideas, which you've heard about. Uh, and uh, at that point, uh, uh, it became part of a broader reform as it uh, be began to pass through the legislature and with the help of a lot of people in the legislature, legislators and staff as well, uh, we began to broaden our thinking into the kind of comprehensive approach that you had. Uh, of, uh, outlined in your opening uh, statement there. Uh, one thing we did uh, as well at the board, uh, state board, was we had the, uh, in my mind, I had the standards, meaning uh, Common Core, e uh, English Language Arts, Math, Science, and History, Civics, at the center of it, and then I had a, a core, and I had this wheel around it, that we would align and make all our state policies coherent. Uh, and so, yes, we redid the assessment into smarter balance, and we, you know, came up with new frameworks. But we also uh, brought in special education in some ways, career and technical education, charter schools, uh, and, and uh, areas of that sort, so that the policies hung together. And we then used our waiver authority at the state board to enhance uh, uh, even more the, uh, the, the local control. Uh, so I think that was the, uh, the areas. The areas that um, we didn't, uh, one area that we did not address uh, in that period, which I want to mention, is that one of our recommendations in 2008 was to adjust the entire formula for the different costs of living in the different counties. It's not equitable if Santa Clara County gets this, assumes a dollar there is the same as Nevada or Colusa County. Uh, it just doesn't buy as much. And we never had any pickup on that, and I'd like to bring that up and uh, work on that in the future. Second- I, I will uh, give you a chance to come back to all those proposals. Yeah, and so that's just one of several that, that uh, I'll pick up later. Great, I wanna ask you one other thing. Uh, you know, you're uh, a budget guy initially, and you were in DC working on uh, Office of the Budget. And this idea that the budget is over here and educational decision making is over here and never the twain shall meet is, you know, common in the way that schools and education agencies run. But you had this idea about how to bring those together, how to get people in the budget office having to think with the people in the education uh, side of the house about what are we going to spend our money on. 
And that was kind of critical to this theory of action around LCAP. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, uh, what you were trying to do there and, and uh, how you think that could uh, be an alternative to the old way of doing things. Yes. Um, well, the local control of the LCAP, um, it, it, I think one thing it has its problems, and I'll discuss them, and others will too, but one thing that we, I think it's largely successful in, which is overlooked, is that you can't do it without bringing the budget office to confer with the curriculum and instruction area. Uh, you just can't do it. And those areas, I observed, the budget was over here, dealing with an accounting code that really didn't uh, have instruction in any sense uh, as, as a way that you budgeted. And then over here was a curriculum instruction department, and there just wasn't the meshing of the two. So that was a key idea, and I think that has been uh, certainly one idea that has uh, helped a lot. Uh, the second is budgeting is largely incremental uh, and uh, not really rethinking the base. And one of the things we hoped for and was in setting priorities that the LCAP would help with strategy and setting priorities. And it's had its problems with that, but at least it's a forum for that. Uh, and uh, I think that the, uh, the underlying budget structure is really just uh, uh, not working well, and, and, uh, uh, and, and I think that it's, uh, it, it still needs more work. But uh, I think we made some progress, uh, much more to make. Also, involving parents, uh, they, you know, they couldn't get into the incremental budgeting. It was in accounting codes that were a lot meaningful. Uh, recently, we added the students to it. I uh, wish I'd thought of that in the original yeah. uh, 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 part of it, and, and, uh, and, and I think that's an enhanced it as well. We've been, uh, and so I think we've, we've tried to uh, bring it much more in as a programmatic priority setting area of still work to be done to make that happen, given all the compliance parts of it that have been part of it. I think uh, locals ought to think of strategy, priorities first, then fill out the compliance part. Right. Uh, and, and instead, often they go to the compliance part, complain about that, and don't get enough to the strategy. <laughs> I will say, uh, talking to people all across the country, uh, one of the things that I think is particularly important about what happened with LCFF and LCAP is that we have these priorities, we have a dashboard, we ask the communities to look at how kids are doing on each of those elements of opportunity to learn and outcomes in various ways, and then make some decisions together about how to spend their money. And uh, when I talk to folks around the country about accountability and dashboards and things like that, most states have no mechanism at all for anybody to ever look at the dashboard and have a conversation about what is it telling us about what we ought to do, and then have some reason to have to get together with others and do it. So I think it's been a, uh, an engine for those conversations uh, and for attention to the uh, many uh, measures about learning that uh, very few states have. Um, I want to turn to Anna because, Anna, you were there in the very beginning uh, trying to figure out how to do this and what to do, and then had the, another bite of the apple in the Newsom administration to kind of take it further. And I know that, uh, and we're talking about these systemic reforms, that you have a, a very, um, uh, a, I don't know what the adjective is, very well-defined vision of systemic reform that creates you know, equity and opportunity across the whole system rather than just little incremental uh, dollops. And uh, I wanted to know how you think about and how you think we should think about this idea of a progressive system reform. Um, I'll take a stab. Uh, so if we step back and we I kind of the way in which I translated uh, our direction from uh, for from Governor Brown was we got to solve for we got to solve for equity. We got to solve for opportunity. We got to solve for results. And we got to make sure that whatever we do is practical so that it happens in the foreseeable future as we go to uh, getting back to the different elements. Um, as, I, as, I, as I think about kind of that overall frame, I, I, and I think about the journey, in my mind, it's been about continuing to, um, continuing to focus and continuing to, uh, to double down on that base premise 
Um, and that base premise that I think, if I remember correctly, I th always think about the difference between 2012 and 2013. And in some ways, the focus of what LCFF was about, I thought got really sharp in, the, in, the, in 2013. And I, there, there are many things that, uh, that changed me forever in the process of uh, working for Governor Brown. But there are three, three conversations that are very much top of mind for me. Uh, and all of them in some ways tied to LCFF. One was his, uh, his underlying continued point of fiscal prudence is not the enemy of democracy, and in my mind, democracy and opportunity. It's his fundamental predicate. The second one um, was about, um, it was a conversation around LCFF and the importance of making sure that as we were thinking about equity and as we were thinking about opportunity, we were thinking about it in all ecosystems and that we were focused on the principle that, that he reiterated when arguing for the, uh, for the LCFF, which is that equal treatment of people in, uh, in unequal positions is not justice uh, yield. And so as I think about what, what was, what was uh, being done then and uh, what's been done since, it's around uh, really focusing on that principle and, and first with the focus of how we fund schools and the focus of outcomes in schools Second, with the focus on making sure that schools have the essentials. And third, really um, bringing that focus on equity to all of the necessary ecosystems to make sure that our uh, state is, is doing what it can uh, to, to ensure that we are supporting families and providing opportunities. So hopefully that answers the question, but that's kind of part of how I think about what that journey was about and how those pieces have continued to be part of the anchors and the focus of uh, work that's been built on uh, on those elements. Well, that resonates for me because I've heard you talk about it <laughs> as we've been thinking about the, the later steps. Um, so I also want to just go back to sort of the strategy of getting this done because it was enormous. It was really quite historic. Um, and so you've got philosophy, uh, which is well articulated here and goals, and then you have to have strategy or strategery um, that happens in the moment to get the thing done. And I just wonder if you could comment on some of the strategic questions you had to deal with uh, and issues you had to deal with to get this going uh, after, you know, what, such a huge drop. So, uh, so my, my former boss will correct me, but I think one of, one of the things was around, uh, well, so, you know, there were a lot of discussions at the point in time which was like, okay, Governor, we hear you. We got to get to our system being more equitable. But we will get to our system being more equitable after we have um, gotten everybody back to equal. So it was basically like, Governor, we hear you and we'll set up a formula that will get implemented on the 12th of never because we have to achieve <laughs> adequacy first. And so part of the initial question was in setting up the table. And part of it in the second year was, okay, we, we recognize, we get it. We gotta get to hold harmless. We gotta get enough funding for everybody so that it can work and we gotta get the biggest amount of funding uh, to the places where we have the greatest needs. So the conversation first became about clarifying, then became about using those two levers for solving. So what's the base grant level and what is the, um, what is the, uh, the, the concentration uh, level that, that makes sure that at the end with the formula you're achieving the goal of, um, of equity. One thing that was happening was the hold harmless level kept ratcheting it up and it kept be not being enough. And I remember going to, uh, and Sue, check me if I'm off, but I remember going to, <laughs> to talk to the governor before putting together the May revision and he was like, stop. We've changed it three times, just stop. Let's change it when we know what is gonna get us across the finish line. So it was like really helpful in terms of focusing on where, where do we need to go. Um, so, uh, my recollection is uh, CTA was the first statewide association that uh, endorsed the LCFF, um, even though it caused all kinds of challenges uh, within the membership. And, uh, and uh, Joe Nunez um, was uh, very much focused on we're gonna get this done um, in 2013. Uh, interestingly, my recollection is the Senate Republican Caucus was the first caucus to endorse it because they thought it was the only way to get to a place of local control. So it was kind of interesting in terms of how it was moving. And then we basically got to a point where I think the formula was pretty much uh, you know, landed. Um, and, uh, and then we were in like a place of uh, 
word salad with a lot of confusion on the accountability system. <laughs> and then it became, uh, well, we can't move on the formula until we have the perfect accountability for all of time. <laughs> and I think we had like maybe four weeks. And then uh, Sue and I were like, <laughs> okay, like we cannot, um, and then folks who were opposing um, it because they didn't want to uh, do the redistribution were focusing on the accountability side, which to me reminded me of single payer, uh, folks that were saying they were single payer advocates kidding, killing health reform uh, to be able to protect the old insurance market rules. Um, and you're just like, okay, how are we gonna get past go here? And so Sue and I reached out to Brooks and John and said, okay guys, like we're about, we're, we're about to get there. And this whole discussion of we don't have the accountability system fully wrapped up is going to be the death nail and that can't be. So you guys come back to us with like, <laughs> what do we gotta do <laughs> so that we can land this plane? And so I guess that's a bit of my, uh, my recollection of of some of the twists and turns. And I guess if I step back, the main thing was uh, we, uh, we had a boss who made us focus on where we are and where we need to go and be very creative in between. And uh, um, my colleagues, Nick Schweitzer and Thomas Todd and Chris Ferguson um, saw the sunrise of the Department of Finance more days than I care to remember, <laughs> working on different iterations of how to make the math work. And uh, our other colleague who would always, when we started meandering and losing our focus, was bringing us back to what are we doing, was Sue. And uh, we all were constantly iterating until it landed and then we pinched ourselves and then we said, oh God, now we gotta get to implementing. <laughs> so that's, I what I, a, that's what I remember. It's a wonderful uh, account, yes. I ahead. think one element is we somehow we put this in the budget and everything else was closed down and the legislators wanted to get the budget done. So you have the hammer of putting substantive measures in the budget and you push it across the finish line. <laughs> And it's, you know, this is not an easy thing. One of the things that's um, extraordinary about LCFF is that there wasn't an immediate lawsuit. Usually school finance reform happens on the heels of, you know, a lawsuit at that moment. And this was really coming out of the legislative and uh, gov gubernatorial leadership process. Uh, but there had been a lawsuit, uh, and John was one of the people who <laughs> brought that lawsuit way back in early uh, 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s with Williams. And um, that ended, you know, uh, with a small settlement, really, of, you know, was useful, but it didn't do all of, all of the uh, redistribution that we're talking about here. So what do you think was important from getting from that point uh, in, you know, almost a decade earlier to the kind of reform that we ended up with LCFF? Yeah. Um, thanks, and a really honor to be here with, with such a esteemed group of colleagues. Um, the, the, the LCFF, I think, reform um, would not have happened with, without Governor Brown's leadership and, and Mike Kirst's sort of intellectual power. So I really want to, uh, and Anna's like ability to implement yes. it and make it happen. Um, so all three of these were really critical. But it didn't spring like wholly formed in 2012 as weighted student funding and then 2013. Uh, it really was, I think, a decade long process of examining the school funding system uh, and um, a lot of advocacy from grassroots groups and equ equity groups to say, the current system is not working. It's, it's not adequate, it's not equitable, it's not fair. Uh, and we, we, um, we need to get some you know, new structures in the system. The Williams case, there was a, even before the Williams case, the Commission on the Master Plan for Education, and I know you submitted a lot of papers on that and Jeannie Oaks and others probably in this room. Uh, that started to get the weighted student funding f uh, formula in the conversation in California. Uh, and then Williams in 2000 was filed that said, look, the states are washing money at that point. It was the first um, internet bubble. Uh, 
but we have, we're, we're 49th out of 50th, and our, some of our schools are in third world conditions. They, they're not, 33% of the, stu, the teachers reported in our statewide survey that they didn't have enough books for their kids to use in class and take home for homework. Uh, and our experts in Williams had to go to the third world to find the research where such conditions existed to say what is, what's the impact of not having books in your, in your schools. Uh, so Williams kind of set a marker to say, look, the state has a responsibility to ensure the basic conditions of learning are met. Uh, and um, it was not about ultimately uh, affecting the funding system per se. We continued the grassroots groups to, to advocate around this and um, in 2000, we fought the budget cuts that turned out thousands of students and parents in, in 2008 and nine. And in 2009, we had a bill that uh, Assemblywoman Brownlee carried for us that, that was proposing to put a bipartisan blue ribbon panel together to reimagine the school funding system adequate equity wage student formula it it passed unanimously through the assembly and um all but two or three votes in the senate and governor schwarzenegger vetoed it concerned about cost pressures uh and the the following year we did file a lawsuit uh that was on um uh about adequate school funding the campaign for quality education via, um, via california and and then the csba and pta and acts have filed the Robles Wong case, uh, both of which said, look, we got to make this thing more rational, built on a lot of Mike's research. We've got to have a way to funding system. We got to have a concentration factor and we got to have adequacy. Well, we didn't get that part, but <laughs> I think all of that advocacy and those grassroots voices did inform the, uh, the thinking when we got to, to LCFF. And um, as Anna said, there was a, a, a a realization that year by the administration that we need equity voices to support this and come out strong. And if, if they don't, this thing could teeter. Uh, and we use that leverage to, to, you know, radically ramp up the engagement to get parent involvement as a state priority uh, and to win proportionality, which was not part of the uh, original Brown plan. It was more of what I call a carte blanche. More money to the districts to do what, what they want with as they see fit. And we said, no, no, your theory is kind of an input in that more money for poor kids are going to help. So there ought to be some parameters, not the tight categorical parameters, but there needs to be some parameters that that extra funding is going to increase or improve services for Heine kids, and, and we did get that and uh, um, in the statute, and then we really really got at the state board where, when Mike was chairing. Yeah. So I know all of you have thoughts about what we should be doing next. <laughs> so we've gotten this far. It's made some difference. We're going to hear more about that. Uh, but I do want to uh, give you an opportunity to, to um, say some things about you know, the next 10 years, if you will. Mike, I know you have that list. Yeah, I have my list. <laughs> so we'll start with you. Yeah, yeah, I'll go fast. Uh, cost of living, I, I think we need to look at that. We need a study of that. Uh, New York does an adjustment for different costs in their counties, Texas and Florida, all three states. So we're a vast place. So I, I, I think we need to, to take a look at this as the economy gets more intense and expensive in certain places. <clears throat> Second, the big categorical that was not in the paper that Goodwin Liu and I did in 2008 when Goodwin was a professor of law at uh, Bolt Hall, uh, UC Berkeley, um, was special education. Uh, we didn't really understand it uh, well enough to, to do anything. Uh, and we uh, uh, also uh, uh, felt that it would be difficult to attach all those changes you need in special ed to the single bill. And so uh, I think we need to address special education. Uh, there's three studies by WestEd, one on finance, one on governance, one on accountability. 
I think they provide the background to do it, and I think having that population out there and not really part of this is, is not good. Uh, third, <clears throat> we need a new measure of poverty I th and need. I think the uh, school lunch program is now very widely spread, and uh, we other uh, PACE and other groups are looking at uh, how to uh, learn from the federal require of programs like the old food stamp program called SNAP and others uh, that is, uh, has more precise measures of poverty. Um, um, next, we, what are we going to do about enrollment decline? <laughs> we have had a huge enrollment, enrollment decline uh, and carrying all those districts that hold harmless through the pandemic. Boy, if we come down on them all at once, there's a lot of districts that are going to be howling. So I'll be, I think we need to be very nuanced, and we're not, we've never faced an enrollment decline like this all at once. And, and you, I know, Linda, you estimated through between 200,000 and 300,000, uh, even with T, uh, TK, uh, traditional kindergarten, coming in. Uh, so I think that's an important. I think as far as the... Uh, uh, the issue of uh, low-income schools in districts that are not primarily low-income. Uh, the administration has their equity multiplier. That's an interesting idea. Uh, I think we need to think that through more carefully on how to do it. What I don't think is right is to go to a Title I program where the money has to go by direction to the state to particular schools. I think we've been through a recession and a pandemic and a post-pandemic. All of those, to me, argue for the principle of subsidiary, uh, subsidiarity. Um, <laughs> and and uh, I think that's a, a major issue. Uh, and then finally, um, I think we need a, a study of the LCAP. Um, it's been amended six times. And the last study was by uh, Pace and getting down to facts. And that was after the first change. There's five more, and uh, they didn't really have a complete handle on the first one. So uh, I think we need to step back, say, we've done a lot. We've really uh, changed, you know, there's a lot of legislation, I'll put it that way. Uh, what has this done? And there's a lot of more regulation, and, and how can we really rethink it at this point? So, Anna, you uh, had that uh, opportunity to come back around after you know, watching what was happening with uh, the Newsom administration. Uh, what would you say you know, guided the direction that this administration has taken and uh, where you think you know, it ought to continue to lean in? Um, with a longer answer than Linda Darling Hammond? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> so, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's uh, it's kind of been the double down on focus. So, in some ways, and it's in, in, in taking on kind of the extension of uh, the LCFF principles. So, it's partly focused on what are some of the elements that we think are essential in order to be able to have the results, as Governor Brown spoke, to um, focus on the teacher pipeline, recruitment, retention, uh, and uh, that those elements, uh, you know, kind of the, the schools and the broader community, uh, community schools, um, some of the uh, early childhood uh, elements, and I think you've seen a variety of different elements that are around the value proposition that is public schools, uh, focus on extended year, focus on, um, on, uh, on uh, extended day, uh, focus on um, on uh, the you know on on getting to uh, TK. Uh, so uh, I think that it's it's kind of in my mind it's been those elements when we see the uh, and, and continued focus uh, and we see that in the multiplier this year um, on making sure that we are uh, that that we continue to refocus on. Um, what else do we need to be doing to ensure that the principle of equity, we're continuing to look at it, we're continuing to go back and saying, okay, where do we need to deepen our level of focus? So first, uh, with some of the increases on the concentration side, now uh, with that principle. So I guess I've been, I, I think of it in a simplistic way in terms of, you know, double down and increase the focus and where we see that the tools are needed across the system like in uh, in in support for um, for our teachers uh, and for uh, our number of teachers doing that where we see it's needed in terms of um, increasing support for families, the important investments in CalWORKs, 
And, and if I can, speaking to the fact that, you know, we're, we're looking like we're about to go into, um, into uh, a downturn, I think just as the focus on um, equity was part of the state's plan during the pandemic and continued focus on the issue of the day, but that North Star, um, you know, the same, uh, you know, first the state is in a much better position than it was uh, before Governor Brown. Uh, school districts are in a stronger position than they were before and continuing to um, maintain that focus up and down uh, is uh, in my mind part of a, an important element, right? The state is in a, in a, good, in a good place, in a good track with reforms that we see are, uh, are, are having results. So how to continue to have that focus and uh, deepen that focus as, uh, as you continue to deal with you know, cycles, uh, in my mind, that's been part of what the administration worked to do and part of what I see as elements for the state continuing to move forward. Yeah. So this Did idea, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, but I, I hear this notion of this broader ecosystem for children and families in, in what you're saying, and then the reinforcement around investing in teaching. Um, so, um, John, I want to ask you, give you an opportunity to answer the same question, but I also want to use a uh, question from the audience that relates to this. Um, so what do you think is our greatest challenge in the next decade with LCFF and our greatest opportunities as you think in ahead? Yeah, so I think the, the greatest challenge remains one that was there at the outset, which is, uh, as Mike has acknowledged several times in his um, career, we didn't deal with the adequacy. We haven't dealt with the adequacy. And um, one of my greatest fears is people will say, well, that LCFF thing and the equity, it didn't really work. Well, it, for it to work, we need to have the base grant be an adequate level to educate an average child to the Common Core standards. We don't have that. And as long as we don't have that, districts are forced to cannibalize some of that supplemental and concentration grant to just provide the basic services. So um, California continues to get an F on the um, uh, Education Law Center yearly analysis of school funding in terms of uh, effort. Um, we're, we're one of the wealthiest, you know, fifth largest economy in the world and percent of personal income spent on public education is, is one of the worst uh, in, in America. So. Uh, we have the means, we need to figure out how to, uh, in a five or 10 year plan, get to adequate funding so that the, the formula will actually work. There are other problems or, or other improvements that really need to be made. 20% supplemental, I mean, the proposal is 37.5. <laughs> Many states have 70% or even 100% supplemental grant for high need kids. The 20% is, is not really sufficient in my mind. And, you know, we probably should be duplicated, not unduplicated. So there, we have other challenges in front of us, but I think it all kind of underlies getting, getting to adequacy is one of the most important ones. Governor Brown, you get the last word. I think the overall one reality is that those who are better off are doing better, and those who are worse off are doing worse. So if you look at the scores, uh, black and Latino, it's down in the low 20s in terms of uh, performance on state standards, particularly in math. Uh, if you look at the higher income or uh, middle class, upper middle class, doing a lot better, uh, although still 55%. So um, uh, the, in, the inequity, the, the dislocation, the stress on uh, people who don't have adequate income is so powerful that everything we try to do is still gonna be modest relative to the challenge of a profoundly unequal society. So we're, we start way by, behind the line uh, if we want to have an equitable society. And I can tell you, I have a school with 95% you know, uh, so-called low income and eligible hot lunch, and it makes it, it's, it's very challenging. And what I see needed is you got to pay the teachers enough. And in these poor places like Oakland, uh, San Francisco, it's, the cost of housing is so high. How do you get the student, the teachers? Then the students are, uh, there's a lot of troublesome students. How do you deal with them?
big, big teacher burnout, lots of teacher burnout. So you need, uh, you got to pay the teachers more. You need coaching, good coaching. You need some kind of school for principals. So the principals got to be at the top of their game. And then the teachers have to be continuously improving. And, um, you know, it's, it's a big challenge. I just want to say, because I've had a charter school that I've worked on, Oakland Military School. Uh, we got everything. We got 18 uniformed members of the National Guard. I've raised 18 million bucks for the school over the last 21 years. And we are still challenged. Our scores are low. We're fighting to get them up. Uh, we're hiring. Uh, I am spending $400,000 for outside coaching. Some of Bill Honig's uh, people that are now in that company. I'm throwing everything I can at it. It's difficult. It's difficult when you have uh, families that don't have the resources that probably most of the people in this room have. And, and I that, think that, that key point. That is, however we overcome that, that's what's needed. We can have all the formulas, concentration, stuff. On, I don't know what all that means. All I know is these kids uh, need a lot more than they're getting. And the so, teachers need a lot more because a lot of times they don't, they can't manage the class. They don't know enough. They need a lot of coaching. They need a lot of encouragement. And then you need a leader called the principal. And I, I think there, these are huge substantive problems. Just helping the teachers and the principals get better. Then of course you need a lot of money in the system. And unfortunately, you got a lot more stuff now. You got trans, the pre, pre K. You got the universal health care with all the uh, expanded Medi-Cal, and then you got the prison system. We got a bunch of stuff, and then we got climate coming down. And so I, I would you... say things are gonna get tougher. That's yeah. my thought. So. <laughs> thank you for that optimistic ending to no, our I, panel. Well, <laughs> I, I just, no, because but... you're all here. You're here for a reason. <laughs> know what the problem is and get at it. Yeah, and, uh, and, and I think the, the fundamental point that you've made, which we, you know, we have been keeping under the rug since the 1960s, or 70s is the profound inequality in income in the society. The top 1% of people have more wealth than the bottom 50% combined. Uh, it's more disparate than it's been since 1929. And children are not generally supported in society. We're now 63% of kids in California public schools uh, from low income families. And that's a huge change, but it's nationwide. And so there is a bigger picture here beyond schools that schools are trying to deal with. How do you create the ecosystem in schools that's pushing back on the social neglect of children and families? So on that note, I know that we have uh, used all of our time. Uh, this is an amazingly brilliant panel. Thank, uh, help me thank them. Wow, that was really something. <clears throat> thank you very much, and thank you, Linda, for running back. Okay, so next we're going to hear from Rucker Johnson, who's the Chancellor's Professor of Public Policy in the Goldman School at UC Berkeley. He's also a Faculty Research Fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a Senior Fellow at uh, Learning Policy Institute. This is the second study he's done with uh, LPI, this one entitled School Funding Effectiveness, Evidence from California's Local Control uh, Funding Formula. Welcome, Rucker. Thank you. So great to be with you all and to follow <clears throat> the distinguished first panel. I am particularly delighted, I think, to build on the conversation that happened with the origins of LCFF. I think more attention is typically given to short-run budget deficits uh, versus the deficits of opportunity uh, facing children, particularly from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds that fuel achievement gaps and that influence the socioeconomic achievement uh, mobility trajectories into adulthood. And so often, right, the political process incentivizes short-term thinking. Um, the short-sighted policy approach um, ignores many of the large returns and long-term benefits to children and to society of the robust public investments in K-12 when we, pre-K through 12 when we make them. And these really deliver large returns on investment for the government and even pay for themselves down the road. Now, why I'm here in part is to highlight, first, how money is spent matters. But the funding itself has to be adequate, equitable, stable from year to year, and to enable districts to spend strategically so that when they're targeting one resource, they don't have to cut another 
in order to make that possible. So we want to recognize the visionary leadership of Governor Brown, of Newsom, to continue that students aren't taught by dollar bills, but that the price of educational opportunity and what money buys is really what we're trying to feature. And so part of that bringing that into focus is a recognition that cross-sectional data is a snapshot, a still photograph of a point in time. And, and we're seeing that kind of photograph. But what we're recognizing is that an analysis of the causal impacts of funding on student achievement trajectories requires longitudinal data akin to a movie that better illuminates origins, development, and the dynamics of learning over time. And so we're going to bring that evidence, the student level, public, full universe of public school students followed from kindergarten and even before kindergarten throughout their K-12 experiences. And we're going to put that in stark contrast to using aggregate time series, just snapshots that give a incomplete and inadequate picture and descriptive even portrait of the causal roots of achievement gaps. And instead of looking at kind of just time series, aggregate time series data, we're going to be looking very closely at the district and school level resources linked to the longitudinal student level data for the full universe of public school students in California. I'm talking about 6.2 million um, students across their K-12 years. I'm going to put the highlights of LCFF. We've already seen some of the elements of LCFF highlighted in the prior panel. So I'm going to kind of focus in on the evidence that shows how the evolution of LCFF impacted student achievement. Where I'm going to show causal impacts for spending for each grade, every subject. It's the first comprehensive uh, study for all grades, all subjects, for a wide variety of student outcomes. And I'm going to also zoom into the distributional school specific effects of that spending to highlight how the spending matters, but how what ways the spending was done um, impact um, the effectiveness of K-12 funding across schools. Okay? Now, part of the exploring the mechanism is also to be able to replicate success requires us to know what school investments matter most based on the evidence, and then thinking about what these next steps are. Now, let, let me be clear about the movie that I'm describing. We're going to stop at 2019, partly because that's when the pandemic starts setting in. And so part two will be you know, the sequel, when we talk about how we recovered from the pandemic and how we got back on track. But what I'm really just trying to describe first is the evidence for the first seven years of the rollout. We're talking about all 10,000 schools, 1,000 districts in the state, with particular focus on the rollout period of LCFF implementation from 2013 through 2019. Now, the funding, the $18 billion commitment, right, it became fully funded in the 2018-19 school year. So that we don't bury the lead, we find positive significant effects of LCFF-induced increases in per pupil spending for every grade every subject and every school that experienced the new infusement of school state funds, we see a significant upward trajectory. We find that the results clearly demonstrate a dose response such that the longer students are treated for the symptoms of poorly funded schools and the higher the doses of school funding reform administered, the larger the improvements in student achievement trajectories are found to be. We also want to underscore that beyond describing questions around whether money matters, we're putting particular new evidence about contributing to understanding of the types, how, when, why, and for whom school funding matters most. Now, again, we find the impacts of achievement increase with school age years of exposure and with the amount of increased LCFF funding. I'm like wanting to. Okay, I'm, I'm needing maybe some, some help with the fast forwarding capabilities. We find impacts on college readiness and high school graduation rates. We're gonna try to continue that to be able to look at college um, level outcomes. We're finding significant narrowing of the achievement gap by race and class, significant reductions in socio-emotional markers that are connected to student behavior problems with significant reductions in suspension and expulsions, and significant improvements for the learning trajectory of English language learners um, who's, who are identified as um, EL students in kindergarten. And most importantly, it's important to recognize that because of the cumulative nature of learning, 
Early learning begets later learning, and therefore the higher baseline achievement is a conduit that enables students to take greater advantage of subsequent learning opportunities in school that's further augmenting this achievement growth. And that's part of the connection that we're finding synergistic effects of transitional kindergarten with the early elementary school uh, spending increases. And, and so I'll close on, on those pieces as we move forward. Now, remind yourself where we started. This is a figure that represents the whole universe of public schools in the country. Every dot represents a school district, and the size of the dot is in proportion to the district enrollment. What I want to highlight here is red represents Massachusetts, one of the very uh, significant spenders in public education, and one of the most progressive funding formulas. This is on the eve of our LCFF passage, before it had been instituted. California is in the white dots. What I'm just trying to underscore here is in grade level equivalents, students in our most disadvantaged socioeconomic uh, districts versus our most affluent. We're seeing about a two to three grade level difference in achievement, but I also just want you to fixate on not just the, the socioeconomic gradient in achievement, but how even within particular um, socioeconomic strata that students in Massachusetts districts were outperforming those in California and that the gradient in achievement was much starker in California relative to Massachusetts. What we document is the funding formula. Both the adequacy and the progressivity were a big factor, and we're able to see evidence of closing of that gap. And that's what I'm gonna to try to highlight here. So remember, this prior panel went through a lot with regard to it's not targeted to district property wealth, but the students based on free reduced price lunch, English language learners, homeless, foster youth. So I'm not gonna replay all of that. But remember, we're talking about a base grant of $8,000 per pupil um, with a larger amount allocated to the early elementary school grades to keep class sizes smaller in those early grades. We got $1,600 for each high need student from the supplemental grant. And importantly, to account for the concentration of poverty, a concentration grant to realize that equal educational opportunity can't be realized without having that additional dollars the concentration grant, 5,300 per high need student in districts um, that are greater than 55% high need. Okay? So what I want you to see about that is part of what Governor Brown was even emphasizing is this tension between increased autonomy and accountability, and that what we were at the extreme in rigidity and restrictions. And so one of the things that the LCFF did was also give and grant greater autonomy over how to use the money. But remember, we were in a situation where the hemorrhaging of, teach, uh, of funding after the Great Recession, right? That wasn't gonna be turned around without LCFS passage, but the rollout was incremental. And what I want you to see is this rollout is what we are leveraging to be able to identify the causal impacts of the funding independent of the coincident other policies that are happening. The thing I want you to see in this figure is the 55% kink, and I want you to kind of realize that funding that's both predictable and flexible allows districts to focus the spending on the needs of the local community. And what we're trying to underscore is that if funding is indeed mattering, we should see a reflection in the achievement outcomes that reflect that subsequent rollout. And I'm gonna document that is indeed what we find. Now, again, 6.2 million students. We're linking the finance data for the full universe of districts dating back to 1995. We're looking at test score outcomes and all of the array of high school graduation, college readiness, et cetera. Okay? Now, what you want to realize is that these pieces are interconnected. And so you have to think about not just funding at a point in time, but the duration of exposure. So when you look at the data that I'm going to underscore, we're wanting to link the funding reform to how did they spend the money. Is it class size reductions that were prioritized, teacher salaries? Is it how does that affect teacher turnover, guidance counselors, health services? We're compiling all of the fiscal data, administrative salaries, buildings, teacher professional development. We're breaking down the spending to follow the money so that we can look at how it's connected to the student achievement and ultimately mobility patterns. Now, this is just a summary of looking at the evidence from the elementary school grades. So by the end of elementary school, we're looking in here documenting, think about 2014 is really before LCFF had been really implemented and contrasting that with students from the same school who are in these grades in 2018-19 school year. So we're comparing students in the same grade from the same schools but across successive cohorts, 
that experience differential exposure to the spending increases. And what you're seeing is on the left side is the left side of less than 55% disadvantage. What you're seeing is an improvement in math achievement across the full distribution where the x-axis is the district proportion of students disadvantaged. So we're seeing a significant increase in math achievement in elementary school from the 2018-19 cohorts that were exposed to the LCFF throughout their elementary school years, or at least a significant number of those years, relative to 2014 cohorts from those same schools before LCFF had been introduced. And notice that we're seeing this improvement, but we're seeing it most pronounced on the other side of that 55% where the concentration grant, again, was targeted. These are not just something we see in math achievement, but we see the same pattern of improvement. Notice zero. Usually, if you look at the pre-LCFF period, there's a significant declining gradient of achievement according to district proportion disadvantage. After LCFF, the improvement, controlling for the baseline uh, level differences in achievement and the pre-existing achievement growth differences across district, that becomes important. We don't just see this happen overnight. So what I want you to see is what I showed you in the figure before was the darkest blue line. But notice the red line is one year after LCFF. The, 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 gray, the, the kind of pinkish line is like two years after. And you're seeing improvement, but it's not happening overnight. In other words, it's the duration and the consistency and the sustained investment that's leading to the transformation. We don't just see this in elementary school. We see the same pattern in math achievement in the middle school years. We don't just see it in math achievement, we see it in reading achievement. We don't just see it in middle school, we don't just see it in elementary school. We see this build toward the high school years that are important for college preparatory. And when you put the pieces together, what we see is that the evidence demonstrates that a thousand dollar increase in per pupil spending experienced for three consecutive years led to a full grade level improvement in math. So if you were able to get, receive this funding in your third grade, fourth grade, and fifth year year, we saw fifth grade achievement be a whole grade level improved relative to earlier cohorts from the same school prior to that, those um, funding increases. We see the same magnitudes of a full grade level improvement in reading again, for three consecutive years. So if we're looking at eighth grade reading, I'm talking about being exposed to this funding throughout your middle school years. We're seeing a eighth grade reading achievement, a full grade level improvement over previous cohorts from those same schools. Now, what we're trying to also illustrate is that this translated into significant improvements in high school graduation rates, about a five percentage point increase for students, low-income students in districts that got a large spending increases versus a small spending increase. And it's all being identified through focusing on the spending independent of these other family and neighborhood background. What we also think is striking is the increases in college readiness, that we have markers for college readiness, and there's big achievement gap differences by race and class. But what we see is that if you experience this $1,000 increase in per people spending throughout your high school years, I'm talking about ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, $1,000 increase translated to a 9.8 percentage point increase in the likelihood of, reading, of reaching math, um, college readiness standards, and a 14.8% or 14.7% increase in the likelihood of reading, <coughs> reaching reading college readiness standards. <coughs> These are transformational and reasons to celebrate. Now, at the same time, there's big challenges by trying to understand what are the pathways, which types of spending are appearing to matter most. Okay? Now, this is where we break down not just the average effects, but we break it down by all of the 10,000 schools and districts, and this is just a histogram, for example, of sixth grade math achievement. So controlling for the third grade math achievement, I'm looking at the fourth, fifth, sixth grade, thousand dollar increase in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, holding the third grade achievement looking similar, and just looking at how does the sixth grade math achievement as a function of this increase in per people spending. We're seeing, when you look across all the schools, Notice it's centered on one, meaning on average, it's a whole grade level improvement. But the most important thing I want you to see is not the heterogeneity or the differences in school uh, spending effectiveness across schools. But what I really want you to see is this is zero. All of the histogram is to the right of zero. To say all of the spending in all of the schools that received it, we're seeing significant improvements. Okay? Now, 
84 to 95% of the school spending effectiveness in terms of differences, we find that three or four major factors can dominate the explanatory power of what's explaining things. Class size reductions, teacher salary increases, that led to teacher turnover reductions, that those three pieces are some of the most essential school investments that we saw consistently boost student achievement. We saw accompanying that with uh, increases in resources for guidance counselors and health services and teacher professional development that helped implementation of the Common Core Standards, for example. Now, because I'm running short on time, let me say a few things. Okay, first, I want you to recognize the, the significance of the early years and particularly even the years before kindergarten entry are a big part of, you can see this just reflected in the fact that about half of the achievement gap that we see at third grade, half of that was already apparent at kindergarten entry. And so what I really wanna highlight here is that it's not just that the funding and that students experience the largest achievement gains when instructed by high quality teachers, that experience, credentials, and the stability of that teaching workforce matter. But I also wanna highlight that LCFF tilled the soil for the significant achievement growth students experience, but the introduction and expansion of transitional kindergarten has continued to water and nurture that accelerated growth. Now, what I want you to kind of understand is what we see is that for low-income children, transitional kindergarten magnified the impacts of the LCFF-induced increases in elementary school and vice versa, that when kids showed up at more school ready, we see significant improvements. So again, this is all pre-pandemic, but we saw about 66% of students who were eligible actually enroll in transitional kindergarten when it was um, first um, rolled out. We're seeing the original rollout was focusing on that December 3rd cutoff, and so you can see um, on either side of the cutoff. And we see basically this big significant improvement where if you attended transitional kindergarten and it was accompanied by a well-resourced elementary school, we saw a much more sustained impact of that access to early pre-K experiences. And again, it's not just that the early pre-K, or in this case, transitional kindergarten matters, but it's the quality and the consistent exposure to high-quality school learning environments. Now, again, I'm out of time, so I'm gonna close here. We're here in part because there's a collection of high-level policymakers, researchers, advocacy organizations, where we're trying to know what works. We're trying to know when does it work. The research community is really trying to do that work. I'm here representing some of that. But the how do we make it work on the ground and that practitioner community to kind of think about is it working in, in how we recover from the pandemic and the school reopenings and closing. That requires a coordinated effort. And the thing I just want to underscore about my final remarks is that Adequate and equitable pre-K funding are the keys to seeding the future. And teachers are the water and sunlight, develop the skills, nurture the socio-emotional development, and cultivate the gifts of our young people. It's a shared investment that we make in all of our children, and all systems change starts at the people level. And so the recipe is really before us, and the question is, how do we continue to fulfill the hopes and expectations that our public school system can achieve. So I want to thank you for your time. I apologize for going a little over. I look forward to the question and answer. Governor, it's good to see you. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with our audience on this 10th anniversary of LCFF. As you know, just a decade ago, California's education system was failing in every imaginable way. We had among the worst funding systems and the lowest achievement in the country. We also had the largest class sizes and the most impoverished curriculum. And LCFF began to change all of that during Governor Brown's administration. Over these last four years, you've added more than 30% to the LCFF base budget. That goes for core school operations, and you've used those equity components of the LCFF formula to allocate nearly twice that much to schools from other state and federal funding sources. But beyond that, you've allocated billions of dollars to initiatives that further expand educational opportunity. 
Can you talk about what's motivated you to make these investments and your vision for where you think our education system should go in the future? Well, the through line for all of this, uh, I think for every administration at the end of the day, and I think all of us would agree with this, is, is our kids. It's about setting them up for success in every conceivable way possible. And I think that's fundamentally at the, at the heart of the local control funding formula. It's the promise of equitable education grounded in what has been identified in many ways as a revolutionary approach to school funding. And, and by the way, that approach, you gotta give credit where credit's due. Uh, I wanna thank Governor Brown uh, for his vision and leadership in this space. And of course, um, Ana Monta Santos, who I saw as she carried that torch uh, between administrations so we can continue that progress. Without them, we simply would not be where we are uh, today. Their work uh, has created advantages and opportunities that parents now are seeing in many respects as, as table stakes, as standard. Uh, so our, our administration's collective investments build off that and they, and they now are allowing us to lay claim to this. And I never imagined 10 years ago we'd be laid claim to this, that we now have investments that place California well above the national average in spending, well above the national average in spending. I know it's not enough, but it's well above the national average today. You know, what we're also doing is kids are spending more time, uh, most now of their time, most of the day at school. And so we've got to make every second count. And that's why we're investing just over the last two years, as an example, some half a billion dollars, $500 million in, to new liter literacy coaches and, and reading specialists, something I needed uh, as a kid. Uh, for high need schools in particular, addressing the concerns around learning loss and addressing, addressing those, those stubborn gaps. We're also increasing learning opportunities through before and after school programs, unprecedented investments. Simply put, we've never done more in before and after school. Um, also expanding summer school programs. Uh, the investments uh, place us, I think, in the top tier in the United States, as well as the investments we're making, unprecedented investments, major investments in childcare needs, supporting our parents in their childcare needs. And it's not just slots, we're really investing in quality. I know we have a lot more work to do in that space, but we're doing more in that space than we have in the past. And forgive me for being so long-winded in, in response, but we also are creating a brand new grade, TK for all, a brand new grade, it's now pre-K, to 12, not just K through 12. And, uh, and that is an exciting prospect and, uh, and that will continue to roll out like our after school and summer school uh, for all programs over the course of the next few years. The funding uh, is there to make that real. By the way, speaking of funding, uh, last just two brief points, our community schools, you know, $4.1 billion of investments to focus on the whole person, wrap around services, blur those lines between uh, the school districts and, and the cities and counties that surround those districts so that kids have a nurturing learning environment. And we're competing with the best that are out there uh, in, in well endowed and supported uh, uh, other private uh, schools and, and charter schools. We're also investing, and in, I want to thank you for this, in investing in the Golden State Pathways program to build vocational programs in high schools and, and, and doing more to integrate the work of K through pre-K to 12 schools and our university system to advance uh, more successful career pathways. And, and finally, because uh, I forgot to mention this, this is really important this past year, we've also incorporated a new equity multiplier in partnership with the legislature. Um, and we incorporated that equity multiplier into the formula to amend the accountability measures to ensure that equity gaps within the school districts are identified and profoundly and importantly addressed. Equity is grounded in access and we're pulling out all the stops to ensure well, that all our kids, all our California kids have equal access to learning opportunities. Our work is not done, but the progress we've made in the last decade, last 10 years, I think is nothing short of amazing. The seeds we've planted, nothing short of amazing. And, and I'll just close and thanks for allowing me to be a little long-winded in that response. But I, I wanna thank again, you and your team and, um, and everybody out there for the progress. The, so many of the people that are gathered in this room today, that progress is because of you and your faith and devotion to our kids and, and the cause that uh, holds us united and holds us dear here in the state of California. So that's a long-winded way of saying this, two words, thank you. Great, so as we, as we heard, you know, the, um, 
the governor acknowledges you. You know, it's many of the people in this room who've worked so hard to make this possible, and, and uh, we'd like to thank you as well. Okay, so we're gonna get to our final panel of the day, which will be taking up some of the ideas that we've heard so far, but really looking uh, forward as we can um, think about what we might be able to do over the next decade to strengthen and increase the progress that we've made so far. And Tara Kinney, LPI's Chief of Policy and Programs, will be leading the panel and will introduce the panelists. Tara? Come join. Come on up. Choose your seat. <laughs> I don't know about you all, but my brain is buzzing from the conversation here so far today. Um, we've heard about the vision for the local control funding formula and some of the impacts it's had and some of the challenges it wasn't able to solve at the time, including how to adequately fund special education, how to address widely varying costs of living across the state, uh, as you raised for us, Mike, how to get to adequacy. Um, Governor Newsom just described for us the ways that his administration in partnership with the legislature has sought to build on this foundation and strengthen it even further, including funding LCFF so that we're now well above the national average in per pupil funding and creating an equity multiplier and the related changes in the accountability system to ensure equity gaps are identified and addressed. Uh, and today I have this distinguished set of panelists who can help us look to the future. As we consider the next decade of LCFF, how might it be further strengthened? And so let me briefly introduce them, and I'll point you to their bios um, that are longer on our event webpage if you want to read more. Assembly member Al Muritsuchi represents California's 66th Assembly District located in the South Bay and Harbor area of LA County. He's a former prosecutor, deputy attorney general uh, with the California Department of Justice and former Torrance School Board member. Assembly member Murasuchi chairs the Education Committee and serves on the Assembly Budget Committee, where he plays a central role in shaping California's education laws. Superintendent Lamont Jackson leads the San Diego Unified School District, the second largest district in the state of California. In his more than 30 years working for the district, Superintendent Jackson's held the position of teaching assistant, teacher and coach, principal, chief human resources officer, and area superintendent. Julian LaFortune is a research fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California, where he specializes in education and economics. His primary areas of focus include K-12 education finance, school infrastructure, human capital, and labor market policy. And his work includes recent analyses of LCFF, which he'll be sharing with us today. And Martha Hernandez is the executive director of Californians Together, a coalition focused on improving schooling for English learners. She has 42 years working in public schools in California, hmm. including serving as an assistant superintendent for Fillmore Unified School District, okay. curriculum director of Ventura County Office of Education, and as a district administrator, principal, staff developer, and bilingual and special education teacher. And she's the former president of the California Association for Bilingual Education. Mm -hmm. So with this incredible group of people, we have the expertise in the room to think big on an open canvas about the future of LCFF and explore a range of ideas and perspectives. Um, so Assemblymember Murtsuchi, I want to start with you first. So we heard from Rucker in his briefing just now about which instructional expenditures were most closely associated with improved student performance, including reductions in class size, teacher salaries, mm -hmm and reductions in teacher turnover. And so from where you sit as a policymaker, how are you thinking about the implications of these findings? Yes, well thank you. Uh, first of all, I uh, wanna thank the Learning Policy Institute for inviting me to join this uh, distinguished panel, as well as this great conversation that we're having here. You know, I was gonna start off by saying that I was always a true believer in the local control funding formula until Governor Brown threw me uh, you know, uh, uh, under the bus earlier. Um, and I, I, I wanted to uh, uh, use, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, how I was one of the increasingly smaller number of legislators who are still in the legislature who was here when we first passed the local control funding formula in 2013 to highlight, you know, where I think we need to 
uh, move forward um, in terms of strengthening the local control funding formula. So 2013, I, I arrived in the legislature, and I had just come from the Torrance School Board, uh, where I was, you know, I like to say I, was a, I survived the Great Recession. I survived all the budget cuts of the, uh, the late 2000s, and, uh, you know, I, I want to dispel any, any uh, false notions about suburban school districts swimming in, in, in funds. Uh, during the Great Recession, Torrance Unified had to lay off, I believe it was around 10% of our teacher workforce uh, as a result of the, the state budget cuts. And so I want to use that uh, to, to tie into uh, what uh, John Affelt was talking earlier about, you know, highlighting the issue of adequacy. You know, back in the late 2000s, or, uh, you know, uh, or when, right before we passed the local control funding formula, California was still near the bottom in terms of per people spending. And then we got this proposal to, you know, redistribute funds to, you know, give more uh, to students, uh, districts with the students, the, the largest number of students with the greatest needs, uh, you know, in order to um, uh, address their, their 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 greater needs, and you know, I mean, as 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 a Democrat, I mean that that is you know, it just makes sense to me as it does make sense. Uh, and we've seen uh, Professor Johnson uh, and his 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 findings uh, confirming that that in fact uh, was the right way to go. But you know, at the same time, you know, uh, my concern at, at that time was that, you know, the base grant was not enough to ensure adequate funding to make sure that we can provide a basic education to every, you know, six million California public school students, uh, whether you're in a, a large urban district with a, a high number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, students with, with uh, greater needs, uh, or whether you're in a suburban school district or whether you're in a rural district. And so I, I think that that is, um, you know, one of the, the um, challenges that we're going to continue to face as especially where you know we're looking to start entering into uh, you know tougher budget years uh, how are we going to continue to build on uh, the success of the local control funding formula while, while at the same time making sure that we are providing adequate funding uh, for all of our school districts to make sure that, that we're, we're, we're providing a quality education to all of our kids but having said that, you know, I, I want to uh, focus specifically on Professor Johnson's findings. You know, the, the three most effective ways of, of uh, you know, uh, funding to, to make a difference in terms of student achievement. Lowering class sizes, increasing teacher salaries, and uh, reducing the teacher turnover. I mean, to me, uh, all three of those are in one way or another directing, focusing funding on supporting the classroom teacher. And, and I know that uh, you know, uh, research after research shows that the biggest way that we can make a difference uh, in, in terms of the quality of education is getting the best teacher in the classroom. And so you know, class sizes, what does that mean? Especially I, I learned this uh, from the budget cutting years you know, more uh, smaller class sizes means hiring more teachers, uh, having uh, more funding to hire more teachers. Teacher salaries, uh, of, of course, you know, the, the attract, uh, you know, attracting and retaining students uh, or, or teachers, uh, you know, encouraging young people to go into the teaching professor uh, profession. The number one factor in, in that's going to drive that is increasing teacher salaries. And last but certainly not least, the, 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 the teacher retention. Um, not only uh, increasing uh, salaries, uh, reducing class sizes, but also providing the professional development, you know, the, the whole child programs that Governor Newsom uh, and, and the legislature have, have championed in recent years. Those are all, um, uh, you know, areas that we need to continue to focus on. Uh, I, I, I do have a bill, Assembly Bill 938, uh, that is focusing on increasing teacher salaries by 50% by 2030, trying to uh, use what Governor Brown uh, originally championed in, in the original LCFF, having funding targets to, to build toward that goal of increasing uh, a teacher and essential school staff salaries by 50% uh, by 2030. I, th that, 
you know, I, I, you know, while I know that that's going to be uh, difficult uh, with upcoming budget challenges, uh, we still need to keep an eye on making sure that we are doing everything we can to address the teacher uh, shortage crisis. Thank you so much. And I think that that theme, which we heard so much about on the first panel from Governor Brown, from Anna, of the importance of investments in, in the teacher workforce, the folks who are in front of students in classrooms, right, mm -hmm. and other staff in schools is key. Um, and uh, the, the notion of how do we increase the base um, mm -hmm. to be able to support um, those investments, I think, is an important one. I'd like to turn to you next, Superintendent Jackson. Um, so you bring a unique perspective as superintendent of a large urban district. You've been working on the ground in your district throughout the first decade of LCFF, but you also have the experience of having worked under the, the prior school funding system as well. And I'd like to um, ask you how you see the theory of action of the local control funding formula playing out in your district, right? This notion um, of giving districts both more funding and more flexible funding, yeah. guided by the eight state priorities, right? But with a focus, leave, and then leaving it to you with your community, right, to make the best decisions for, for your district. Yeah, thank you, and, <clears throat> and it is a great honor to be a part of this panel, and um, uh, it was great watching uh, Governor Brown and uh, others do their thing. Um, and, and I would say, you know, given the, the history of education in California, I shouldn't be here because I'm a product of the broken system, mm. right? But what's different and what's aligned is I'm a product of great educators. And before I answer that question of, of you know, what's, what's been working, I'm going I'm to say this. Uh, there are some other factors that I shouldn't be here. Right, I'm a black man from a divorced family, raised by his grandmother, who passed away in, in his senior year. The following year, best friend uh, committed a triple murder. Uh, a year later, his sister was shot and killed. Uh, a year later, his father passed away, and one of his great teachers passed away of AIDS. Um, I, I should not be where I am, but it, it was for, as Governor Brown says, great teachers providing me opportunity and access that allowed me to pursue my own career in teaching. It was a uh, teaching credentialing program that I was a part of that allowed me to be here. As uh, Governor Brown mentioned, great leadership uh, under Alan Burson, the superintendent, then superintendent, part of the Educational Leadership Development Academy as a uh, administrator. So why I say this is because we already know the answer. We know what it takes to provide opportunity and access to children like myself. Uh, where my father, you know, worked at UCSD and, uh, you know, made a salary of $14,000. And, and creating the, the hope and the promise that we can break generational poverty. Um, and so for, for me and, and for San Diego Unified, we've benefited because that's where we have been focused, to make sure that we have not only smaller class sizes as suggested by Rutgers data, but quality educators. Because I can tell you this, you can have one-on-one -on -one if you don't have a great educator, no one wants their child in that classroom. So you need to have qualified and quality educators, so that means teaching credentialing programs that provide access to uh, great pedagogical practices. Um, likewise, you need to have great leadership uh, focused on uh, equity, focused on creating conditions for students to belong and creating opportunities for students to thrive. And that's the foundation. So for us, our investment uh, has been around that. And providing coaching and support side by side, educators uh, during the school day and focused on data, uh, not the, the uh, specific outcomes, uh, the um, summative assessment, but the formative assessment, assessment to drive the changes in practice. Um, and 
and then you say, okay, is that enough? Well, we're talking about our black and brown children who have been most historically marginalized, our students with disabilities, with, with IEPs, uh, our students who are multilingual, learning a, a language um, other than their native language. We're talking about a group of students who have historically not had opportunity, and you have to commit to that, and you have to make sure you're putting money um, in those areas and monitoring. And so as Governor uh, Brown mentioned, uh, it takes a firm commitment. The, this notion of the bureaucracy and strings and categoricals is just not what we need. Um, we need more money in the base. We need more opportunities uh, for students to um, study outside the school day. You know, uh, in the video we watched, the, the, the movie it talked about, you know, we moved from seven period days to six period days. Well, in San Diego Unified, we're moving from six period days to seven period days to eight period days to four by four you know, uh, schedules in our secondary schools for students to have opportunity in the school day. And then we're investing in uh, extended learning opportunities. I had uh, Al down uh, you know, seeing our student interns who were recruiting for the teacher pipeline program in, as juniors and seniors working with our elementary students. That's where we're investing in the teacher pipeline. Um, That's such a rich example. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we talk about TK. We did universal TK. We were committed to using our uh, base dollars to fund universal TK before we were getting funded from the state. That is our commitment. 4,400 students uh, involved in our, our program with 90% of those students staying in our district. So as enrollment was declining, our TK programs were sustaining that. And so we've been able to use these dollars in, in great ways, committed to uh, putting our, our dollars uh, with the most, um, our students who need it the most. Thank you. I mean, the, 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 I think those examples are really helpful and really help flesh out, right, what that flexibility in spending, right, guided by your data, pointed you to in terms of investments in your teacher pipeline and staffing, expanded learning time and a longer school day, um, and universal TK. Um, I wonder if you could share with us a little bit about um, what being a concentration grant district has meant for you? What has it meant to be that, to receive that kind of resource? We heard a bit of the, about the importance of that from Rutgers research, and I'm curious how it plays out in San Diego. Thank you, and um, I, I think, uh, I know um, Mike Kurtz talked about the, uh, the future, and I would double down on all that he said, because, mm -hmm. you know, as we talk about concentration for San Diego Unified, we are a concentration district at 60%. Um, we're right on the cusp, if you would. Um, and that translates to about $30 million. Uh, and that's great. Um, but the context of San Diego Unified is changing. And um, most recently, I, I saw a study, and I don't know the details of the calculation, um, but we are um, one of the most expensive cities, if not the most expensive, in the, in the nation now. Mm. And I think that um, looking at regional aspects, as uh, Mike Kurtz suggested, is going to be critical. But for us, um, we've been able to utilize those dollars for, um, you know, we have a large Latinx population, uh, many students who are uh, language learners, uh, many students who are in poverty. And, and when we look at poverty now, we have to think differently because it, it is playing out in Santa Cruz Unified a little bit differently. Um, and we could lose that, that $30 million. And, um, but what we've been able to do is use those dollars in the schools um, where our students are, are showing up uh, in great need and providing additional reading um, supports, mm -hmm. math supports, um, mental health services, um, extended learning opportunities. Um, these are priority students. These are our, um, what we say our spotlight students um, where we can put more educators there, lower class size, provide additional resources and paraprofessionals, um, more counseling support. So that's how we've been able to use these dollars. But we're certainly paying attention that we're right on the cusp mm -hmm. 
Mm. Um, and a loss of $30 million would be significant um, as we head into uh, the out year of, of, we're looking at a $30 million reduction mm. um, coming out of ESSER funds um, and the elimination of about $166 million to San Diego Unified um, and over 900 people. And so we can talk about the great things that we've been able to do in terms of mental health clinicians, extended learning, um, opportunities, um, middle school, athletics that has just um, become bigger and greater opportunities for students um, to showcase uh, greater opportunities in visual and performing arts, um, but we're at risk of losing that. And so we really do need to um, lean on the, the theory of action of the LCFF over the last uh, 10 years, but now rethink um, how we think about concentration dollars, supplemental dollars, um, specifically the base grant, yeah. um, thinking about regional aspects, um, and the reality. If San Diego Unified is facing this, I imagine um, we're facing in other parts of California where educators are leaving, and so teacher salaries, and that's ongoing. It's not one time. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so we, we need to think about those things. But concentration has really been uh, powerful for us mm -hmm. um, in meeting the needs of our, our um, students who need it the most. It is sobering to hear uh, you say what it means to be on the cusp and, and, and what your outlook is in terms of potential um, staffing cuts and what that means for your students, especially in the highest and, need schools. And, and just uh, uh, we, we were able to do a, a little calculation, and, and this is a very complex concept, but um, you can see the dollars. So we're 60%, uh, the cut point is 55%, it's about $30 million. If we look at uh, duplication versus unduplicated, um, at $10,000 of students, we have uh, about 15,000 uh, students. Um, you take the 13 who are uh, duplicated, and you run those calculations, you're gonna see uh, supplemental supports of $27 million, concentration of $88 million. So you're talking about $120 million uh, roughly that you would see just uh, simply saying that uh, someone who is a language learner has this need and they are also um, facing poverty. Um, those are separate needs and deserve to be looked at individually, but that's the delta that you're looking at uh, from our district. And, and if you combine that, that's a delta of about $150 million. Significant when we're talking about equity and access and opportunity. Thank you for making that real for us. And I know I heard John Affelt mention it earlier, and I, I think we'll, others on this panel are, are, are um, on that wavelength as well and thinking about maybe um, the importance of having a conversation about duplication and the count. Um, so Jillian, I wanna come to you next um, because like Rucker, you've done extensive research on LCFF and you recently published a paper at the Public Policy Institute of California in September examining the reach of targeted school funding. Um, and I'd love for you to share with us a little bit about what you found in that study because it looks further into LCFF um, uh, further along in years than Rucker's study did. And so we'd love you to build on that. Yeah, absolutely. And first, I just want to you know, <clears throat> say how honored and humbled I am to be a part of this panel, a part of this event, you know, in the room with so many of you who have helped shape and implement, you know, pass LCFF and really bring us to where we are today. Um, so that's a great honor and, you know, really pleased to be here and share some of the work that we've done. Um, and as you mentioned, um, we've looked a little bit more recently and, and in our work, we focused uh, when we looked at outcomes, first and foremost, we focused on the impact of the concentration grant, which Rucker talked about. Um, and just to kind of put that into context, districts that are at the highest levels of concentration of need, you know, 90, 95, 100% um, high need, uh, over the last nine years, we've seen an investment uh, just through the concentration grants of about $16,000 per student more in funding. Um, and that's led to, you know, in those districts, 13% more of their students achieving grade level standards. Um, and that's about the same number pre and post pandemic. So that's, you know, that kind of the impact of the funding, the impact of the sustained funding um, has had a great impact. And so that's kind of where we started at. Um, but then when we look deeper, what the question that we had and that we've heard a lot um, 
and you know, maybe this is coming from a place of, of skepticism from those who you know, can't hold these two ideas of, well, we have these great impacts, and yet we see these you know, really enormous achievement gaps that have been persistent. Um, the state's achievement is not where, it, you know, where we want it to be, and of course we've come a long way. And so how do those two coexist with one another? And, and when we've looked at it, we find it's really, in our view, comes down to two things. And one, um, the concentration grant has pro you know, provided immense amount of resources and uh, great you know, benefits to students in these districts that get a lot of the funding, but in districts like you know, Superintendent Jackson's that get a little bit of extra funding, um, they're just not getting the same level from the concentration grant. And actually about a little over half of the state students are in districts, or the state's high need students are in districts that don't get as much money mm -hmm. under the concentration grant or don't get these large you know, amounts of, of influxes when we're looking in the thousands of dollars per pupil um, that have these robust impacts. And so that's kind of a question really of adequacy when we get back to what other panelists have talked about. And then the second part is when we look at these districts that then get less concentration funding in total um, and less supplemental funding, the question then becomes, well, with that funding, they're more socioeconomically mixed. Are they targeting those dollars to the students that have the greatest need? And when we looked at that in multiple ways, we find that it actually varies a lot across districts. Some do a very good job of this. Um, and others don't. And when we looked on the most recent LCAPs that we had available, and we could, did a statewide study of LCAPs, we found about 60% of districts um, didn't even plan spending enough money on targeted high-need student groups as they received in supplemental and concentration. And so that's not even just about the actual distribution, just in terms of the plans that they had. And so we think that that's kind of one of the mediating factors. We have a lot of need. There's a lot of needy students in districts that aren't just at the top where we funded very well. Um, and so how do we get it to those districts? And then, you know, how do we make sure that these targeted dollars are reaching the students, you know, at the school sites and even in the classrooms that have the greatest need? Um, and so that's kind of, you know, I think those are the two most important points that, that come out of our research. Mm. Thanks um, for that. And, uh, you know, two really important findings. I'm curious if you could speak to what are, what do you think the implications of those findings should be as we think about this audience of policymakers, of staff, of advocates, of educators? How should people be thinking about this as they think about the next decade of LCFF? Yeah, I think, you know, as I mentioned, targeting, how do we target need within the district? There's a lot of variation in some districts. Um, so how do we make sure these dollars are targeted um, to the students and the school sites that have the greatest need? I think that's a challenge and that, uh, you know, and we've talked about there are school sites with great concentration that exist, you know, great concentration of need that exist within districts that maybe don't get as much mm -hmm. um, funding and, and how do we make sure we can fund those districts? Do we get, uh, you know, do we duplicate counts when it comes to funding and recognize that student need is, is multifaceted yeah. um, and that we have students, you know, with coming in with various needs that, that exist both inside and outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's where we want to go, you know, in the next decade. Um, another thing that I want to bring up, and this has come out of some of our research, is that we're often looking at dollars and, you know, are we making dollars uh, more equitable um, across and within districts, and this has certainly happened. Uh, but when we break that down into the specific resources, um, you know, class sizes, teachers, quality educators makes the biggest difference. And when we look within a district, what we see is that oftentimes there's still this gradient where the most experienced, most credentialed um, educators are in the most affluent schools within a district. Um, and even districts that actually tend to spend more at their higher need or their lower income school sites often have schools at those sites, or they often have schools that have um, fewer teachers or fewer educators, so smaller class sizes, but also less experienced educators. Right. And so there's this kind of trade-off where we have, you know, these, these schools with a lot of turnover, with a lot of need, and yet we have less experienced educators in these school sites where, you know, in the more affluent side of the district, there may be, you know, educators with more experience, more qualifications, um, but we, you know, we spend a little bit less on those schools because we have, some, you know, larger class sizes. Is that the right trade-off? Is that what maximizes um, or you know, helps kind of promote the equity that we want in the system? Uh, you know, I'm not sure what the right level is there. There's a lot of constraints, but I think that's something really worth considering going forward is how do we kind of break that um, disconnect that we have that once we get you know, dollars to the district, it's really about providing these quality educators. And are we doing that? Um, and are we doing that consistently without the levels of turnover that we see you know, in these school sites with the greatest need? And I think we see those same inequities play across districts. And so being, you know, a district with a high concentration of high need students that can take those additional resources and put them into, say, increased salaries in a place like Oakland or San Diego or San Francisco, which is my district, um, 
is, can be critical to, yes. to, to tackling those inequities as well. Um, and I think, Martha, I'm guessing a lot of this resonates with you, given the work <laughs> that you so do um, at Californians Together. Um, and, you know, we know that we're a state, right, serving a very linguistically diverse population. Mm -hmm. More than half of entering kindergartners speak a language, it was a language at home that's not English. And at any point, about one in five students in California is classified as an English learner. So recognizing this LCFF, right, pay particular attention to the needs of English learners. And these students, along with students from low-income families and students uh, in foster care, are one of the groups that, that generate the additional funds. So in your work, you have played a key role elevating the needs of English learners um, and monitoring how LCFF is working to meet those students' needs. And what have you seen in terms of how LCFF has focused attention on the needs of English learners? And so thank you, Tara. And, and also, I, I want to also express that I am honored and humbled to serve on this panel with this distinguished you know, individuals. Um, so thank you to the Learning Policy Institute. And yes, uh, for over a decade, since 2013, we have uplifted the needs of English learners. And in fact, in collaboration with the Center for Equity for English Learners at Loyola Marymount University, um, we have written and published four reports over these 10 years. And we have looked and analyzed a district LCAPs for their targeted uh, attention and focus to English learners. And um, I do have to say that after every report, uh, we hoped that the findings would be different. But really, overall, um, our findings have underscored that there has been limited, sporadic, targeted attention to English learners in districts um, LCAPs. And of course, um, this is um, very troublesome because of the fact that uh, there continues to be a persistent achievement gap. And um, so, uh, but I do want to say that after 10 years, there is progress and there is something to celebrate. And, um, and so um, um, we have kind of made a decision that we will probably, even though we said that we would not, we probably will write a fifth report. And it is, we are anticipating that um, we will find that there has been a sharpened focus on English learners due to the new LCAP template mm -hmm. and to um, the governor's budget trailer bill, mm -hmm. SB 114. Um, you know, in our fourth report, um, we noted that there was an absence of differentiated growth targets, uh, which means that districts were not really paying very much attention to gap closure. You know, there's just very little. And um, so um, we are, you know, we're very concerned about that. But we are celebrating that the new LCAP template is requiring specific metrics for identified student groups um, in terms of desired outcomes and goals. And so we um, you know, celebrate that this is a big step in the right direction. And in terms um, of the equity uh, multiplier, we know that those um, LEAs, those local educational agencies um, that have schools that will receive this, um, that um, those schools will be required to provide a focus goal for these identified student groups. And so um, we believe that there's going to be a change and that actually English learners, um, and not just you know, monolithic English learners, but the different profiles of English learners will have um, added um, attention. I think it's um, very important to note that we feel really um, you know, pleased um, that the new LCAP template um, has affirmed the importance of educator partner input, um, as specifically in terms of providing input about the um, disparities between um, student groups. And I do have to say um, that um, we are happy that um, now um, there is a requirement that long-term English learners uh, be 
reported um, as um, a you know specific, specific student group, group yes. and that their needs will no longer continue to be invisible um, but more visible and yes. I'm hopeful that districts will actually um, you know grapple with how to um, meet the needs of mm -hmm. these very needy students so yes. mm -hmm. okay. thanks for for <laughs> pointing out that I think important change and you know there's been a lot of discussion today about the local control accountability plan um, thank you um, and the importance of that document right first for, for um, fostering conversations at the local level about what does our data look like and what does that mean for our educational goals as a district and where we want to focus and then how do we connect that to budget decisions and that the LCAP will do that around long-term English learners as well as an, I think an important step forward and, and it's also a lot of change for districts to adapt to, right? We heard from Mike, it's been through six, six changes and, 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 and that mm -hmm. um, is a process each time. Um, Martha, is there anything else you wanna share in terms of opportunities you see to strengthen LCFF over the coming decade? Oh, I'm happy you asked. <laughs> you know, on July 12th, 2017, I was privileged to witness the State Board of Education under the leadership of then uh, President Michael Kirst to unanimously adopt a very research-based, comprehensive, aspirational English learner policy, uh, the English Learner Roadmap that superseded um, the English-only policy of Proposition 227 um, that was in effect for almost two decades. And I really think that this policy is really a critical, crucial framework in terms of providing coherence for California's 1.1 million English learners. And so I, I'm looking for perhaps some alignment between LCFF, the LCAP, and the English Learner Roadmap when we're talking about what we need to do for English learners. And, um, you know, we're talking about alignment in terms of a district's goals, actions, and services. And so what can we do to provide guidance and resources and tools and technical assistance to make that happen? I also think that we need to embed the English Learner Roadmap into all levels of the system of support. And um, I think this would go a long, long way in addition to perhaps revisiting the calculation for the ELPI, the English Learner um, per, um, Performance Progress, progress Indicator. Yes. Uh, progress indicator to really um, help to set aspirational goals for English language proficiency. And then this speaks, of course, to the importance of um, supporting and expanding a um, comprehensive um, English language you know, development program in our, our schools. I also want to say that um, all of this should be backed with a statewide implementation plan for um, the roadmap. We've talked about policy, the policy implementation gap. We really need to support um, our districts um, providing guidance and other technical assistance to help them uh, implement this very big lift because it is a big lift. It's a very aspirational, comprehensive policy. And um, I think that California could take the lead in terms of providing assets-based and research-based strategies for educating our English learners. And I do wanna say uh, a couple of other things. Uh, one is in terms of biliteracy. We just um, um, uh, saw a report from the Century Foundation about the fact that English learners do better when they're uh, placed in some form of bilingual setting. And so my thought goes to, I mean, I think, you know, to kind of semi-quote the report, it said that, you know, English learners, you know, um, you know, do better learning their home language. They do better in learning English over time. And they do better in academic subjects. And so why uh, can't we somehow leverage LCFF to expand, initiate these type of programs, to promote these programs um, for the benefit of these 1.1 million English learners? Yes. And so 
I probably yep. have more ideas. I, I, and, and others on this panel too, do, too. So like one of the things I'm taking away from what you're saying is the importance of coherence amongst policies and um, the opportunity, right? Well, thank you. I mean, we want to get to all these questions. So I'm going to ask you all, did anybody else want to chime in um, on the next decade of LCFF and additional opportunities you have, um, you see, to, 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 to strengthen this policy? Uh, I will um, first say thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. We are designing our goals around the LP, which uh, is, is going to be critical for San Diego Unified and our students. Mm -hmm. the, the additional piece that I would say in terms of alignment is, um, and, and we heard it with the first panel, is really getting down to the site level. And so some of us might say single plans, some might say site plans, but uh, the plans that are designed at the schools um, really uh, with specific students in mind, um, our Latinx students, um, our uh, language learners, our students with disabilities, our black youth. Um, we need to really tie that into our LCAP um, and make sure that the funding is specifically uh, going to those, um, those schools. Why that's important um, as we think about LCFF going forward and uh, Martha, you mentioned this. We say English learners as a broad group of students, but newcomers are very different mm -hmm. than students who are in their second or third year, very different from a long-term English learner, very different from an English learner who comes from uh, native lands where they have formal education versus students who have no formal education. And so just in that narrative, we have five or six um, uh, different types of students. So we need to pay attention to the individual student um, because that's the spirit yeah. and the development of the LCFF um, yeah. uh, as spoken about earlier. And so I really, I, I want to just reiterate what Mike Kurtz mentioned about paying attention to the region. We are very different post-COVID. We are very different 10 years from where we were um, in 2013. And we need to pay attention to those regional aspects. Um, we need to think about the economic uh, construct uh, within school districts, uh, within cities and counties um, and the state. Um, that's important. And, and this was a piece that I think is, is crucial. Many, many times students don't have their, their needs being met, we go to referrals um, and they're being assessed for um, special needs, right? Yeah. Um, and so our increased numbers are in um, the realm of students with disabilities or students needing an IEP. And the fact that we don't consider that as one of the factors, mm -hmm. I think um, we're missing out and we're not aligning the, aligning the theory of action and the, um, the central idea of LCFF with a large group of students, mm -hmm. many of them who are disproportionately black and brown children and language learners. And so I think we need to pay very, very close attention, um, as mentioned earlier, yeah. um, in that way. And I was talking to a um, superintendent from Mount Diablo. I don't know if he's still here. Is Adam, Adam still here? And while our districts are vastly different, um, and I don't know his district at all, one thing we agree with is that all money is not good money. The money that comes with strings is very difficult for us. Without the flexibility to, to design for the children that we serve. He serves a group, of, a group of students that are different than the group of students I serve. They may be black, they may be brown, they may be language learners, but they're very different. Um, the communities are different. And so what I would suggest, and I'm not speaking on, on behalf of all superintendents, what I would like is more flexibility, more money in the base, and hold me accountable for making sure that it's in the plan, that it's aligned to the goals and the expectations, and I'm yielding the results that we expect. And if not, hold me accountable. Don't punish the children. That's on me as yeah. an adult. 
Thank you, Superintendent Jackson, for bringing us back to the theory of action right there. Um, I want to get to a few, at least a couple of questions from, from our audience. You all have been very patient with us um, on Q&A. Um, so I'm going to um, point this one to you, Assembly Member. Um, we know the fiscal outlook is not as positive right now mm -hmm. for California. So how might policymakers think about strengthening LCFF in tighter fiscal times? Yeah, I, I you know, just uh, had an opportunity to talk with, uh, with uh, Linda Darling-Hammond before uh, uh, this conference. I, I, I think there's a general sense that, uh, you know, we're, we're all, uh, uh, you know, going to be uh, watching closely when the legislative analyst uh, uh, gives their updated projections uh, in, in terms of the budget shortfall for, for next year tomorrow. Um, but in the meantime, you know, I, I think we're all expecting um, uh, tough, uh, uh, challenging budget years, uh, not only next year, but, uh, you know, possibly thereafter. Um, and so I, I think a lot of the discussion that I'm hearing in the legislature is that we need to focus on, you know, improving the, you know, implementing the programs that we have already initiated, whether it's the, 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 the community school uh, movement that, uh, you know, I, I think has been, um, mm -hmm a reflection of the increased investments to the students with the greatest needs trying to provide yes. that, uh, that uh, you know, wraparound services to address the whole child, uh, you know, or, or whether it's to, to continue to build on efforts to improve uh, 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 instructional uh, programs for our English learners, mm -hmm. uh, that, that we need to focus on, on improving the implementation uh, of existing programs rather than adding uh, n new programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't envy you in your job right now. That's mm -hmm. coming up. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I'll pose it to anybody who wants to jump in here. Uh, as you think about the next decade of LCFF, what are you most optimistic about? And what are you most concerned about? I just want to say something about um, the teacher shortage as it relates to English learners. Mm. And that is, is that uh, we need teachers who um, have the skills and who are qualified to address the needs of all students in California, whether that's our special needs um, or whether that's our English learners, and that we also have a bilingual you know, teacher shortage. And so I just, it's a little bit nuanced that it's not just teachers. And when I'm thinking about uh, planting the seed and I'm thinking about TK, I believe that we want TK to be additive. And if we want it to be additive, um, you know, I'm just kind of thinking, what are our plans to ensure that these students, you know, build on their home language as well as learn English? And what are we going to do in terms of providing them with the bilingual teachers that they need um, to thrive? Mm -hmm. And so I'm um, thinking about our youngest learners at this time. Staffing especially in mm -hmm. those early classrooms. Anybody else with a quick hit answer? Yeah, I think I would say I'm optimistic because I get to be in classrooms on a regular <laughs> basis. When, when Al came down and we were in classrooms, uh, I think we left recognizing that we have um, a large number, vast majority of our students who love to be at school and we have educators who are loving them and we have parents who are happy uh, that we're providing uh, spaces and places for our students to, to grow and to thrive. And despite the challenges financially within communities, our students love education. And our 11th and 12th grade uh, interns uh, who wanna become educators uh, recognize the difficulties that our educators are facing and articulated to us, but we walked out of there with great hope and, and a beautiful outlook, and I get to see that on a regular basis. So I'm hopeful, and I'm deeply committed with an, a tremendous board uh, of education and a tremendous group of parents and labor partners, so I have great hope. Um, I'm excited. I think what, what I want to say, I'm not discouraged by it, but I want to encourage us to stay focused 
on the theory of action and, and our core values. Um, at the end of the day, uh, folks ask me, how do you deal with parents who are upset? And my perspective is this, they love their children. Every single parent loves their children so much, much that if we're not meeting their needs, they're gonna let us know. And so for me, I just wanna encourage us to um, remain focused and I hope we don't lose that focus. Thank you. I think that's a pretty good note to end on. Um, and I know happy hour, I'm seeing the red sign, happy hours out the door. Um, I wanna thank you all. I think you surfaced a lot of very important ideas for uh, this community to be taking up and all of the folks who are joining us online um, will be showing up at your committee, I'm sure. Um, and and um, you know we have our work cut out for us in the decade ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We can just stay, we can just stay here. Right? Thank, thank you so much. That was, a, that was a wonderful panel. We're done for the day. We're ready to go outside to our uh, reception. Um, but before, I, we, did, we do want feedback. And so there is a survey link in your uh, program and in the slides. And if you could give us, uh, take a chance to do that, we'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. And for those of you remote, thank you for sticking with us. Goodbye. Thank you.